Sane Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 8. Numerology and Prophecy There are so many different systems of numerology that to give a definition which would include all of them is not an easy matter. They range from the simple substitution of numbers for the letters of the English alphabet and the translation by their aid into a numerical value of the name which our parents, influenced by considerations of family interest and recently read fiction, saw fit to give us, to the most elaborate mathematical calculations based on detailed measurements of objects celestial and terrestrial carried to six decimal places. Between these two extremes there is every grade of elaboration and every point of view, it is not possible in these pages to give a detailed analysis of all the different systems competing for our attention, nor yet justly to assess their merits. Some of them are of a complexity that demands prolonged study and considerable mathematical aptitude for their understanding, and it is unjust and misleading to criticize a system unless adequate time has been given to its study. It is a simple enough matter to knock down Aunt Sally's of one's own setting up, and the concept of a system which the adverse critic undertakes to demolish may bear very little resemblance to that which its exponents are endeavoring to explain. No criticism, therefore, of individual systems will be undertaken in these pages, but an attempt will be made to explain the esoteric principles upon which numerology rests, and the student may then be able to see whether any given system is likely to be sound or otherwise. Initiates have always attached great importance to number, color, sound, and form, holding that, according to the hermetic maxim, as above, so below, the spiritual affinities of a given object can be deduced from these things, and that with its spiritual affinity it will have a special link. They therefore utilize these objects when they wish to get into touch and bring through into manifestation those potencies on the inner planes which they are held to represent. The uninitiated believe that the force invoked comes into physical manifestation through the symbolic object, but the initiated know that the material object is not employed to enable the power to come down, but to enable the mind of the magician to go up along a particular line of consciousness. His mind contacts the potency, and it is through his own nature that the power comes down, not through the so-called magical object. It must be clearly realized that the value does not lie in the material object, but in the train of thought it evokes. The power, however, may subsequently be associated with the object, thus forming a talisman. The subject of talismans is of great interest, but it is beyond the scope of the present study. The matter is merely referred to here in order to prevent confusion of thought. Objects do not have numerical values assigned to them arbitrarily, but in accordance with some of the profoundest principles of esoteric cosmology. The different planes of existence came into manifestation during different phases of the cycle of the logoidal being. Their substance is organized out of atoms of different types. These atoms are really nothing but force in cyclic motion, vortices infinitely minute. Their motion, however, is not in a circular path, but an angular one, and some follow a three-sided, some a four, five, six, or seven-sided orbit. Each plane of the manifested universe is characterized by prime atoms which possess an orbit of a particular type. Each plane developed a special type of force and consciousness. Each plane had as the focus of its development one of the planets. That is to say, when the evolutionary life wave was on a particular planet, a particular plane was developing. It will thus be seen that a plane of existence, a type of consciousness, a planet, and a particular type of atom will be associated together. The prime or fundamental atom will have a certain number of tangents in its orbit, and this number of tangents will determine the vibratory rhythm of its movement. All the complex forms on that particular plane will be built out of these atoms. Therefore, there will always be, in whatever associations they may be gathered, the fundamental number of that plane as one of the prime factors into which their vibratory rhythms can be reduced. These vibratory rhythms are the basis of all existence, and they can all be expressed in mathematical terms. Hence the significance of number in esoteric science, for these sacred numbers are the formulae of the invisible forces which are behind all things, visible and invisible. For practical purposes, a knowledge of the numerical factors is chiefly of value for determining the inner relationships existing on these subtler planes, 
it has a secondary value in that cycles of recurrence can be worked out if the primary unit is known. But as cosmic units of time are of transcendent vastness, but few have been observed and worked out, and these, being planetary in their significance, they have but little bearing upon the personal destinies of human beings. The coming of the avatars, or Christs, the birth and breakup of civilizations, these things are known to the adepts, but it is exceedingly doubtful whether the affairs of nations are revealed, save in so far as they are incidental to these things. To work out the day of the outbreak of a war by means of one of the cosmic cycles would be like measuring an object seen under the microscope by means of a surveyor's line. Those profound students of the subtler aspects of existence, the Kabbalists, were in the habit of reducing to numerical value all potencies with which they worked, and embodying these formulae in the name given to each potency by means of the number-letter system of the Hebrew alphabet, in which each consonant is equated with a number, the vowel sounds necessary for vocal expression being represented by points, which merely aided pronunciation and had no bearing on the numerical value of a word. The Hebrew orthography grew up primarily as a means for such notification, and was therefore a sacred language like Sanskrit, which was evolved for the same purpose. If, therefore, we are dealing with the names which the Hebrew Kabbalists gave to the potencies they described in their sacred and esoteric books, we may be sure that they are reducible to numbers and constitute formulae which, when deciphered and reduced in turn to their factors, will tell us a very great deal about the potency concerned and its interplane relationships. There is, however, an exoteric gematria as well as an esoteric. Soi de Sant initiates, knowing the principle, attempted to use it as a key to mysteries which were beyond their grade, and so we find the most elaborate experiments in interpretation of the sacred books of the Hebrews' race, interpretations which reduce whole sentences to their numerical value, and from that extract an inner meaning. That such a proceeding is fallacious is obvious, for, in the first place, there are many different versions of these sacred books. In fact, no definite canon was established until the books themselves were hundreds of years old, so that the original wording of the writers was hard to determine. Accuracy of text being unobtainable in the necessary degree, how can there be accuracy in the results of these calculations? That there is a significance in the proper names is not denied, but that there is a significance in every jot and tittle is exceedingly doubtful, and even if there were, it would be impossible to calculate it from our modern imperfect text. Another method of numerical calculation which is having a considerable vogue at the present time, is that based on measurements of the Great Pyramid at Giza. These measurements are usually computed in inches and are carried to several decimal places. There are two different schools of pyramid numerology, one which uses what is called the Pyramid Inch and another which uses the British Inch as established by Act of Parliament. When we call to mind the vast size of the Great Pyramid, the erosive action of time which must have defaced all surfaces, even the internal ones, by some millimeters at least, and the fact that the outer casing of the pyramid has been removed so that its actual thickness cannot be determined, it will be admitted that any fine degree of accuracy in the measurements can hardly be achieved. When, therefore, the calculations based on these measurements are reckoned in inches and carried to several decimal places, any accuracy of result is obviously out of the question. If the premises of the great pyramid enthusiasts are admitted, the logic of their deduction is unescapable, but as the very measurements on which they base all their calculations are mere approximations, and as there are several different opinions among archaeologists as to what those measurements should be, and as, moreover, there are at least two different schools of pyramid numerology, each of which is equally logical in its calculations but uses a different inch, it is fairly obvious that we are not dealing with something that is wrought in the living rock but which is cut out of cardboard at the pleasure of its makers. It is an admitted fact that all temples of the mysteries were symbolic structures. If we want to understand their symbolism, we must enter into the minds of their makers, men like ourselves, concerned with esoteric science. We can best do this by observing the methods of anyone who is getting together the paraphernalia of ritual magic at the present day. Every possible object which has a symbolic relationship to the force to be invoked is assembled in the temple. The robes of the magi and the hangings of the room are of the symbolic color. The number of lights on the altar, the number of knocks employed in the invocations, the number of circumambulations are in accordance with the numerical potency of the force to be invoked. 
A temple used for ritual purposes, moreover, is invariably constructed so as to symbolize the macrocosm and, incidentally, the microcosm of the soul itself, in order that the special rituals performed therein may be related to the whole. If we study the structures used for religious purposes by the different traditions, we shall see this principle prevailing. The Christian Church is invariably cruciform in reference to the great sacrifice of its founder. The sun temples, such as Stonehenge, are circular, referring to the zodiac. The worshippers of the creative force in nature use either the tower or the serpent mound. The worshippers of the Great Mother use the cave or crypt, all symbols well known in analytical psychology. The Sphinx is a symbol of the four elements. It is also androgynous. There is every reason to believe that the pyramidal form was used in the same spirit and for the same purpose, as a symbol enshrining great cosmic truths to be used in the raising of consciousness, and that it represents not a book of prophecy, but a glyph of the universe, and, incidentally, of the constitution of man and the way of evolution and initiation. Esoteric science was not persecuted in ancient Egypt. The priests had perfect security for their records. Why should they be at such pains to conceal their prophecies? That the pyramids of Egypt and the stones of Avbury enshrine profound truths, there is no reason to doubt. But esotericists consider that these truths refer to the constitution of the universe and the soul of man, and having nothing whatever to do with prophecy. The Book of Revelation is another favorite subject of speculation. This book, as is obvious from its nature, was written by a Christian Kabbalist versed in the esoteric doctrines of the day, probably a high initiate of the mysteries. Its key is found in the Holy Kabbalah. A study of the Kabbalah should be the basis of any attempt to understand the prophetic books of our scriptures. The beast, whose number is 666, has been variously identified with Nero, Napoleon, President Kruger, and the Kaiser, or whoever happens to be the national boogeyman of the moment. Napoleon, however, is a national hero to the French. It depends upon which side of the channel one lives as to whether he appears as the beast or as the angel standing in the sun. Queen Elizabeth must have appeared very much of a beast to the Spaniards of her day. Which of these identifications is correct? All of them, says the esotericist, wherever a man acts as the instrument of destruction, he is functioning with the force of the beast, whether he be breaking up the home or the nation. The destructive forces, which are just as much a part of the cosmos as are the constructive ones, have found a channel through him and are using him for their purposes. But we must not forget that destruction is always the first phase of construction. A cosmic truth is distinguished by its universal applicability. The sacred teachings delivered by God to man, whether they be expressed in words or stone, do not concern persons, but spiritual principles. The actions of persons and the fate of nations express these principles, and to that extent may be considered as the fulfillment of prophecy. But the promises of these sacred writings have been fulfilled many times, and will be fulfilled again whenever the conditions supervene which they describe. There are two ways of penetrating the future. The only legitimate method consists in observing and studying the causes at work in the past and present, and trying therefrom to deduce their outcome. The more insight we have into underlying and remote causes, the more likely shall we be to draw true conclusions. Esoteric science is of great value in such a process because it reveals more of underlying and remote causes than appears upon the surface. Thereby, it often produces the effect of prevision by supernatural means, yet in actuality its methods are entirely natural and logical. It merely has certain additional data available for its consideration. The illegitimate method of penetrating the future consists in trying to put the clock forward and see events as if they had already happened. The seer using this method is seeking for effects where he should be looking for causes. Events shape and take form on the inner planes long before they appear as actual happenings on the plane of manifestation in matter. A seer who can function on these subtler planes can see them brewing there and report what he sees as prophecy. There is one thing which is forgotten, however, that up to the very moment of occurrence, fresh forces may come to bear, fresh factors be introduced into the case on the inner planes, with the result that the final issue is largely modified. A very strong force will come down the planes with but little deflection, and consequently manifest in matter in its original form, so that any seer who could discern its development as a thought form 
would be able to prophesy accurately the nature of its manifestation on the physical plane. There are, however, but few occasions on which the force is sufficient to resist deflection in its passage down the planes. In the great majority of cases, as soon as it comes within the sphere of the group mind of the race, it is profoundly modified. Moreover, a determined mental resistance will be able to produce varying degrees of deflection. It is this fact of which mental workers avail themselves in the many different systems that exploit the powers of the mind. Prayer and invocation are also potent alternatives. The prophet may announce what will happen if nothing occurs to prevent it, but out of such a multiplicity of factors, anything may occur to modify the course of events. The effect of prophecy is to paralyze effort. In the face of adversity, the human soul ought to rise up in its strength and wrestle with the dark angel of affliction till it yields the secret of its name, that is to say, of its hidden nature, so that it may be subdued to his service. If this be done, good is brought out of evil, the good of ennobled character, if nothing else. But if we accept supinely an impending fate, we have surrendered our manhood. If we must go under, let it be in the last ditch. If we must surrender our lives, let us sell them dearly, not give them away. The power of the will, backed by courage and tenacity, is tremendous. Victory has many a time been snatched out of the very jaws of defeat by a courage that would not accept the inevitable. We can learn many things concerning the soundness of a doctrine by observing its effect during epochs when it was widely believed. The heyday of soothsayers has always coincided with the darkness and degeneracy of national life, whereas the great epochs of national achievement have ever been characterized by confidence in the power of human enterprise. He can who thinks he can is a profound maxim of occult science. We ought to approach the occult arts in the same spirit in which we approach any other phenomena. They are not supernatural. They break no natural laws. They are merely comparatively rare and little understood. As soon as we understand their rationale, they cease to be supernatural and become natural. An advancing psychology is going to clear up all the mysterious element in occultism. Those of us who take up these ancient studies should pursue them as scientists, not as mystery mongers and exploiters of human credulity. When we approach the subject of prophecy in this spirit, it soon transpires that there is no such thing as exact predetermination. There is only tendency.